I am Femi Redwood from Radio.com, and I'm talking with Henry Hicks, the president and CEO of the National Museum of African American Music for our Radio.com check-in to celebrate Black History Month. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we can't celebrate Black history without talking about music, from the African djembe drums that our ancestors played to the songs of the Underground Railroad that contained all of these hidden messages. What does black music mean to you? Oh gosh, you know, I think it means it means everything really. I mean, you know, it is it is the soundtrack of my life and I'm sure yours and and your listeners, you know, it, it is it is really that beat that keeps us going throughout the day and so, you know, whether it's the hip hop I was listening to this morning as I was working out or the R&B I was listening to on the way into the office or the jazz once I got here, it's kind of what keeps us going. So you know, music is everything. Right, right. Uh, so the museum is based in Nashville. And as we talk about Black history, it actually became a sort of part of history in regards to some of the protests that happened down there last year. Tell us what happened. Yeah, absolutely. So there were uh, three young ladies, I think they were uh, youth for uh, change or something of that nature, uh, created a march and uh, they marched from the state capitol through downtown Nashville, and they made it a point to stop right at Fifth and Broadway where the museum was still under construction. And it was really a cool and kind of a poignant moment for me and for our staff here, uh, because we really recognized the significant symbolism that the museum played even before it opened. And so, you know, of course, marches like that, music is a part of it. Music is a big part of the civil rights struggle and movement. As I mentioned earlier, it's a big part of everything that we do. And it was a part of the significance of this march. And so when uh, the group got right to the corner of Fifth and Broadway, where the museum is located, that was where they decided to stop. Two or 3,000 people, maybe actually estimates as high as 10,000 people deep, you could see them all going up the hill and everyone stopped and got down on one knee, some laid on their, on their stomachs. And that was in sharp contrast to behind them, you had uh, police, uh, in riot gear there to, to greet them. And many of the businesses in the area boarded up their shops and that sort of thing in anticipation of and wanting to protect themselves against possible violence. Uh, but we, our team at the museum decided that this was a good opportunity to join in. And so my son and I and a couple of other staff members joined in the march. And uh, while we stayed in the background while we were there, it was important to us to be a part of uh, this demonstration that to say that civil rights and social justice are very important today as they always have been, of course. And, and we wanted to be stand in solidarity with those people. Uh, and so really, it, you know, that's what I hope this museum can be, not only something that stands up for right and for righteousness, but also a place that brings people together from all walks of life uh, to march and to sing and to celebrate to reflect on the past, but also to push forward into the future. And you know, that moment you described, it's not anything new. Music has literally been a part of the civil rights struggle forever. I think back on some of the songs that my parents used to listen to, like, I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> uh, that's absolutely right. And in, in fact, I had on a black and proud t-shirt uh, on that day when, when we uh, did that march. And one of the songs that plays in the museum uh, quite often is Sam Cooke's A Change Is Gonna Come. And so, you know, those songs from the 60s and, and the spirituals from before then, uh, right up to, uh, I think it's Little Baby's uh, The Bigger Picture uh, today, songs are a part of the movement, Kendrick Lamar's All Right. Uh, and so, you know, those songs are, are part of the movement, whether it's a movement from two, 300 years ago or an, a movement that's going on today. You grew up in the church, so you've always loved music. Talk to me about the moment that you realized you didn't just love hearing it from the choir. You wanted to be in this in some way, shape, or form. Well, you know, I tell you, it was, uh, I always say, you know, the Lord works in mysterious ways, and it was nothing that was intentional. As a matter of fact, you know, I, I, I bought a business in Nashville that was in the tourism business, and for, several, for selfish reasons, I wanted to get involved with the museum and help see it forward and see it happen. But when there was a certain resistance in and around the community to getting behind it the way I thought it should be supported, 
I became more and more insistent that it was a good idea and got more and more involved. And before you knew it, I was, I was running the place and, and, you know, even more committed than I had been. And so it really wasn't so much driven by the music, although I think down in my soul, I knew that the music was so significant, but, you know, Nashville is music city and it is known around the world for its country music. Fewer people know about the gospel and the uh, electronic gaming music and even the symphonic music that is produced here. And even the rap and the R&B is there's a lot of it that's produced here. But the city really is a very progressive place and a place that wants the Music City brand to represent things beyond that. And this museum was a perfect opportunity to define that for the city and for the world. And on top of that, it was just it was a, the type of institution that doesn't exist in the country, at least not until two weeks ago. <laughs> so, like, <you> know, <laughs> so we just it was something that, you know, I think myself and my teammates, we just said this is something that has to exist in the world. And we've been so gratified. We've really been about sold out since we opened. And it's really even in the pandemic and we're doing everything we can to make people safe and that sort of thing. But to have that kind of support right out of the gate is really pretty exciting. Mm. You, uh, you went to Morehouse, HBCU grad. You then went to UNC Chapel Hill. You were a White House fellow appointed by former President Bill Clinton. You worked with Colin Powell. You had this extensive career in banking, yet this moment, this right here, is one of the most important things you've done. Why? What is it about it? Yeah, you know, again, I, because it is not about me. It's not about me and my career. It's not about making a lot of money. It's not about anything other than being of service to society. Right. And I think if there's anything that I learned from my mother, who was a teacher, my father, of course, who was a, a pastor, and even the service as a White House fellow and, and you know, the, and actually some of the frustration that I had in my corporate career was I was trying to figure out a way to balance commercial interests and my desire mm -hmm. to get ahead for my family with the desire to be of service and really to make a difference. And so, you know, this is something that I believe, you know, makes a difference. It makes a difference in Nashville. It makes a difference in the country. It makes a difference for the music industry. It makes a difference for African-Americans and it makes a difference for all Americans of goodwill who really want to understand our common humanity. And so that's why I think for me, this was something that I just couldn't let go of and had to push forward and get done. It's so interesting. You keep saying being of service. Your father was a preacher. So I'm sure that's something that he said a lot. Uh, what are the comparisons you see of you know, being of service in the church and then right now being of service in regards to serving the community and educating and uplifting through music. Yeah, well, it's just a different pulpit. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a there's a lot of sim similarity. Uh, you know, I am I am not a biblical scholar, nor am I a, a music scholar, actually, but I know a little bit of both. And I really I think it really is about uplifting people and helping them see their better selves um, helping them uh, look for the greater good in themselves and in their community. And this museum is a place that can do that. Our educational initiatives allow us to reach out to young people as well as to adults. Our preservation activity help to uplift those artists and those people that really help to tell the stories of our culture. Uh, and then our celebration activities, of course, you know, sort of celebrate sometimes people who aren't often uh, highlighted for their contributions. Right. And so the work that we're doing here, I think in many ways is very similar uh, and we're able to reach to a broader public and help them, help them smile and help them see, you know, what's good in themselves and what's good in their community. When you think about how music is a direct reflection of what is going on at that specific moment, uh, sure. you think about, again, the songs of my parents' generations, the I'm Black and I'm Proud, For the Love of Money, all of these songs. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, some of the songs that we're getting today from Black artists are almost similar. Those same struggles, those same economic disparities, those same systemic racism. Uh, does it get frustrating that decades later, we're still making the same types of songs because so little <laughs> has changed? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it does on a, on a personal level, right? I mean, like it, it does get frustrating that we're still having the same arguments today that we've been having for centuries now. And actually that's one of the interesting things about the way the museum is set up is that it is set up not by genre, but it really is a historical walk through American music. And it centers African-Americans in that story. 
And as you go through that, you, you see and you realize just how common some of these themes are and have been, how hip hop has been so influenced by the blues and how R&B was so influenced by jazz and how blues and gospel are kind of one in the same, slightly different messages, but the same beat and really the same yearning for a better life. And that's the message I think that is much of music, regardless of genre, regardless of when uh, it is published or produced, is that it's, it's often a yearning for better, a better relationship, a better life, uh, a, a highlighting of something that's gone wrong and maybe a partial solution to what can be done to fix it. So all of that is what music is. It's storytelling, but it's a hopeful storytelling uh, quite often. And so that's what I think we're hearing in music today, uh, as well as the music of the past. So we're continuing uh, to sing uh, of, of a hopeful future, I think is what we're trying to do. I love that. What's your favorite exhibit in the museum? Oh my gosh. You know, well, I, we've got, that's a, that's a hard, that's a hard one to answer. Uh, but I'll tell you, I mean, there are all kinds of places. I mean, when I was actually just out in the galleries a few minutes ago and I often stop and I'll see something new or different, something I hadn't seen or quite paid attention to before, but you know, in our rivers of rhythm gallery, we've got something that's called takeover moments there. And that's uh, twice an hour. Uh, the museum will kind of go dark. The corridor will go dark. The lights go down and on the walls throughout that uh, theater, throughout that exhibit, it becomes a theater. And so one, that one of the takeover moments that we have is Prince actually uh, performing Purple Rain at the Super Bowl. And I actually think that that Super Bowl was in Tampa, uh, which is where the Super Bowl this weekend is being played. Right. And so, uh, so we've got Prince playing Purple Rain uh, at the Super Bowl in the rain. Uh, and it's really powerful. I mean, the, the sound system and the, the video walls are 15 feet high. And so like, you really feel like you're there. Wow, I can't wait to check it out. Uh, yeah. When you think about hip hop and all of these African-American music forms that are not just dominating every bit of song that we hear on the radio today, but also overseas, like Russia has a pretty extensive hip hop culture, Japan does. Does it strike you as odd that despite this global influence Black music has had, this is the first museum of its kind? Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's the point, right? Is that, you know, the African-American contribution to American music, which has then had international impact and influence, yeah. that story is marginalized, has been marginalized. That's not the way that we characterize what American music is. And so a lot of times folks say, well, you know, American music is rock and roll and rock and roll is centered on, you know, you know, I don't know, White Axe, the right. Rolling Stones or the Beatles or Nirvana or, you know, whoever it might be, whoever your favorite is, but nobody ever really kind of looked at the story of that and said, well, wait a minute, if we really kind of peel the onion back just a little bit, the Rolling Stones actually got their name from a blues song by the name of Rolling Stones. Um, and so the music that is, is African-American music is what American music is. Uh, I often say that uh, Europeans had their music and their culture when they arrived on these shores, they brought it with them. They found Native Americans here and they had their music and their culture, but Africans were forcibly brought to this country and they had to leave much of their culture and their music behind and the few instruments that they brought with them were taken from them and they weren't allowed to use them. So what they had to do at that moment was innovate. That innovation is what we now call American music. And so from the field hollers and the slave songs and the Negro spirituals to the blues, to gospel music, to jazz, to R and B, funk, soul, techno, disco, EDM and hip hop, East, West, and Dirty South. Uh, all of that is an African-American innovation, and that is the foundation of American music. So uh, it's really a cool thing to create a museum that does something that no other museum does and has the opportunity to be a happy place. We mm -hmm. deal with some tough subjects, uh, but people from all walks of life are able to come and, and experience a part of their own musical journey, their own soundtrack, 
and then stand next to somebody who maybe they didn't know when they got here, maybe make a new friend, have a conversation, get a different perspective on the music. You know, last weekend I was in the, in the museum on Saturday and I was watching and, and the, the wobble came on the PA system overhead. And before you know it, there were 10 or 15 people in the middle of the lobby doing the wobble. As you and, would expect. <laughs> as you would expect. And it was the coolest moment. It was the coolest moment because I said, you know, we've done it. We created what we set out to create. There were people that did, did, did not know each other of different races, men and women, young and old, who came together in that moment in this museum to create community. And that's what we're trying to do in the museum. So it's a remarkable thing. Uh, I'm really proud to be a part of doing something, creating something with a really talented group of people uh, that did not exist until two weeks ago. So really excited about it and hope that everybody, uh, as soon as they're vaccinated or when they're mm -hmm. double masked, will come on to Nashville and check us out. Fantastic. And I think that's a perfect place to end this. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, make sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell for all notifications from radio.com. While you're at it, why don't you check out some of our other great videos?